Hi, everybody. This is Charles Hoskinson broadcasting live from warm, sunny Colorado. It's a pretty humbling moment. You know, we finally got here. I, uh, I talked to Carrie, our events coordinator, right before uh, I came on, and she told me 9,100 plus people have registered for this event, almost 10,000 people uh, for something that we uh, pitched to the general public about a month ago. That's just remarkable. It's been a long journey to get here. It really has been, and uh, we've all gone through a lot. I think I've become pretty well acquainted with that couch back there. Uh, way too many long, sleepless nights and uh, too much work. But, you know, it was worth it. Five years in the making, and we finally got to a point to launch Shelly. You know, when we started this project a long time ago, we realized that if we wanted to do something new, exciting, and evolutionary, we had to reevaluate the way the world works. We had to look at things a little differently. We had to start from first principles. Uh, we as an organization, weren't so happy with the idea of just taking the things that Satoshi had built or the things that had come from Ethereum and said, let's start there and build on top of that. We said, hang on a second here, let's just ask fundamental questions and see where they take us. The downside of that approach is it's a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, it's confusing, it's hard, but it's incredibly meaningful paper after paper, scientist after scientist, that dark room that we chose to enter slowly got a little bit more luminant. We saw more light. We got a bit more texture, clarity. The grays turned into bright colors. And we started learning things along the way. The first fundamental question we had to ask is, if we're going to build a cryptocurrency that can scale to billions of people, how should that foundation work? How should that platform work? What should be the heart of it? What is the consensus algorithm for that? So when we uh, started in 2015, we said, let's just figure out what a blockchain is. And there was a wonderful paper written by our chief scientist, Agalos, and his friends. And it basically gave us a good security target, something to look at. And we started a big research stream in proof of work and a big research stream in proof of stake. And we even had some other people who were thinking about even more exotic things. And uh, we didn't know where we were going to go there. We said, let's just go where the science takes us. There's this beautiful endless river that you can sail as long as you want. And that's exactly what we did. Paper after paper, year after year, we started realizing that Ouroboros proof of stake, this concept, was the horse to ride. It was something that had all the properties that we cared about, all the properties that we thought were necessary to allow us to build an ecosystem uh, that is not only resilient, but also sustainable, and over time becomes more decentralized. And that is the heart of Shelley, what we're releasing this month. So Ouroboros is special because it has this beautiful property that as the token gets more valuable, two things happen. One, you get more security. That's a beautiful thing, because if you're successful, you get better. Second, as the token appreciates, you also get more decentralized over time. We have parameters in the system so that more and more small businesses, more stake pool operators can wake up every day, join the system, compete against each other, and secure it. This is the opposite property of Bitcoin. As Bitcoin gets more valuable, you tend to get more vertical integration along private, highly centralized uh, pools that have subsidized power and patented ASICs. And it's no coincidence that because Bitcoin is so valuable now, less than 10 major mining operations control more than 50% of the hash power. So if you can feed the people that run your system with two pizzas, I'd hazard a guess that you're probably not as decentralized as you want to be. Should we achieve the same market cap as Bitcoin, we'll have thousands of pools thousands of small businesses uh, that are regularly waking up every single day competing for your voice, your vote, your delegation to run the system. And it just grows beyond that. More operators, more capabilities, more uh, magic, faster the system gets. It's a, it's a pretty amazing model. And it's something that we spent years and years trying to figure out how to tune. You see, it was an interdisciplinary model. 
It was something that required game theorists from Oxford. It was something that required experts in distributed systems. It was something that required top cryptographers. We had to figure out everything from where to get good random numbers from to things like how do we get a proper clock? What's the synchronization model? This is not easy work. And we set a very high bar. We didn't say, hey, we're just going to go design some protocols that make sense to us, write some proofs, and then have those things uh, just be implemented and hope it works. We said, we're going to take it to the academic community. And there's a beautiful trade-off there. While it takes more time, if you pull it off, not only do you get confirmation from people outside of your project that the ideas you have are reasonable, but then you also, over time, construct the world's largest decentralized brain. You see, I believe a lot in decentralization. And the point of this event is to celebrate us becoming a truly fully decentralized project, stepping away from uh, the safety of a federation and moving into the uncertainty and chaos of a world ruled by the many. And that requires a great degree of care, caution, and um, thought. <laughs> so Ouroboros is, uh, is just unique and special in that regard. And if we want this protocol to evolve and grow to meet the needs of billions of people, it's going to require more research and ideas. And if we rely upon just a single set of minds, a single entity to come up with those ideas, no matter how decentralized the technology may be or the community may be, that is a fragility, an optimization around a central actor that we cannot afford as an ecosystem. So it's so important to build a way of innovating in a very decentralized fashion. So how do you do that? Well, you get the academic world as a whole interested in the things that you do. We've written well more than 60 papers, thousands of citations, many, many academic conferences. And some of the proudest moments have been not from the papers that we've written ourselves, but from the papers we inspired others who don't work for us to write about the things that we do. That tells us that future graduate students, postdoctorates, professors all across the world, from the United States to Europe, to Asia, Africa, South America, will wake up every day and think about the problems we think about, think about the protocols we have designed and use them as a foundation of innovation. And for the years to come, we'll continuously develop new concepts that we as a community can adopt and they can live in the marketplace of ideas. That's a beautiful accomplishment and it's something that we have already begun here with Cardano. Uh, I remember the Nakamoto proof of stake paper that recently came out out of University of Illinois and uh, Stanford written by Pramod Vaswani and his uh, fellow authors. Uh, there was a lot of inspiration they got from the work we did at Ouroboros. Our first exposure to the paper was when we saw it on uh, archives. It was just pushed out there innocently. We said, wow, that's really an amazing result and that's an amazing paper. And it's a great example of what we've accomplished. And over the coming years, we'll see more of that and eventually hundreds, if not thousands of papers and ideas that come out of this process. And we as a community will benefit from each and every one of them. So that's the first accomplishment in our road to decentralization. The second thing that this project was all about was writing code differently. For more than 40 years, uh, there's been a whole movement in the computer science world to remember where computer science came from. When I was younger, I studied mathematics, and it's no coincidence that the foundations of computer science were created by mathematicians. Uh, they were looking for magic machines to help them solve their problems. And while they couldn't quite build those machines to solve the evils of mathematics, they inadvertently created the foundations of computer science with artifacts like the Turing machine, for example. And in the magic of that, uh, it turns out that there are all kinds of tools and techniques to treat computer programs with a bit more rigor. And this is commonly done in industries where failure results in death or the loss of billions of dollars. Uh, we've all marveled at SpaceX, launching their rockets on the pad, being able to take astronauts to the space station. But in their 18-year history, 
how did they get to a point where people would actually trust those systems with their lives? They had to think differently, write code more rigorously. And I asked a very fundamental question. Why is it moral for us to be in a system where when we make mistakes, we as a company don't suffer, but our users do financially and potentially lose other things like their privacy or access to their identity or whatever other infrastructure has been built? So we said, you know, if we're going to go do this, it's not good enough just to do good science and take that science through the 400 year legacy of peer review. We as a company must commit ourselves to a formal approach, the use of formal methods. This is antithetical to everything an entrepreneur will tell you to do. It's slow, expensive. Your time to market is much harder to get to. So we had to innovate. And we brought some great people like Dr. Kant and uh, Lars Brunius and uh, Jared and many others. And we built a whole department that did nothing but think about every day about formal methods and how do we make them more agile? How do we bring them so that they're a bit lighter touch? So you don't measure success in terms of years and decades, but rather weeks and months. This in itself was an enormous challenge. And we rose to that occasion. We had a few setbacks along the way. Some things took a bit longer than we thought. But now when we look at Shelly, not only are we launching Shelly, the soul of Shelly, the formal specifications are right there alongside it. And what does that give us? It gives us an unambiguous implementation agnostic way of talking around the design of our system. So if a person wants to go and write a Go client or a Java client or a Python client, they have a single source of truth that they can refer to. And over time, we can apply more and more sophisticated tools, just like the tools that have been applied at SpaceX, just like the tools that have been applied in the pharmaceutical industry to verify that the things that we are doing are safe and work with a high degree of certainty. Works the first time. It's a moral imperative. And it's part of our commitment to building something that we would like to last. You know, um, I lived in Japan for a while. It's uh, one of my favorite countries. And I remember being in Tokyo and having a chance to talk to some construction workers who were working on the Shinkansen, which is uh, the bullet train in Japan. It's one of the most famous high-speed rails. And one of the things that was truly extraordinary in that conversation was that uh, the particular worker's grandfather worked on the Shinkansen and this worker's son had just started working on it and they had plans to keep working until 2050. They were making plans that far out. So they build things to last. And when you have that perspective of saying, this is not for today, but it's also for tomorrow, the long arc of history, uh, you have to really do things a bit differently and you have to do things with a lot of care and detail. A great moment for us in this conference was when we invited Vint Cerf to come. And we said, Vint, we heard you built something that people tend to like. And he said, what's that? We said, you know, that whole internet thing worked out pretty well, although it's got a few warts on it. Would you like to come to our conference and talk about that? What would you have done differently if you could do it all over again? And he said, sure, that sounds like a lot of fun. And I can't help but think if Cardano ever does achieve that scale and it would be the dream of my life to see that through, we will be on that exact same panel in 2050 or 2060, talking about how we built the world financial operating system. And people will ask us the exact same question that we're asking Vint today, which is, what would you do differently if you got a do over? So it's important to think about things through the lens of decentralization, have a decentralized brain, and to build things as right as you can up front and embrace the process that encourages as much deep thought and collaboration as possible. So that got us to the point where we were ready to turn this over to the community. But being a rigorous project, we didn't want to do that in a haphazard way and say, good luck, everybody. So we launched last year the Incentivized Testnet, and it was kind of a field of dreams moment for us. Uh, we built it and they came, the community came. Over 1,200 stake pool operators, small businesses registered. And that slowly but surely, and through a lot of saintly patience, they woke up every day and figured out how to use the software, how to create blocks, and they started marketing. 
they started telling the world who they were, creating their own branding. Uh, some sent me desktop wallpaper and phone wallpaper. Some created T-shirts. I saw a lot of really creative videos. Uh, it was really an amazing, diverse crowd of people to work with. Thousands joined our Telegram channels, and they proved to not only us, but also to the world that they were ready, capable, and willing to take the reins and turn Cardano into the most decentralized ecosystem. So first, on behalf of IO Global and all of our partners, to the stake pool operators who spent more than six months now learning, waiting, investing, and building, thank you. We couldn't have done this without you. We can build a beautiful stadium, but it's only magical when people come to play and people come to watch. And you guys came and you played a damn good game and you made us all proud. It meant the world to us. And it left us with an incredible degree of confidence to set difficult parameters and to figure out how the system was going to turn on and evolve. Along the way, we realized that we had to innovate in many different categories. You know, and this is one of the reasons why it took a bit longer for Cardano to get to this point than I would have liked. We moved from a monolithic to a polylithic architecture. We had to completely change the way that Cardano is listed on exchanges. We went from a wallet backend that was tightly coupled to our node to a decoupled one. And then eventually we evolved that into a framework for explorers and for exchanges to have a unified experience to understand what's going on in our ecosystem and also to interact with the blockchain and wallet. And the magic of Adrestia is that we didn't just build that alone. Just like Ouroboros, we were able to build Adrestia with exchange partners like Binance. We learned an enormous amount from them. And we've created a wonderful experience that is going to make it very easy for people in the future to safely work with at an enterprise level and at an exchange level, Cardano. And this is just how we've thought along the way. You see, we didn't get everything right when we started. In fact, seldom that was the case, but we learned from that experience. We grew from that experience. We never gave up. There was a relentlessness about our engineers. We truly do have not only the most patient, but I would argue the best engineers in the entire industry and the most inspired We've had a lot of hard deadlines recently. In the last three months in particular, it's been a wild ride. And I cannot tell you how much work has been done at every part of Cardano, every dimension of it, from the product management team to the project management team. And given the fact that we've all been living with the perils of coronavirus, some of our people got waylaid. In fact, Chris Greenwood, the project manager who's been leading a lot of the great work with Cardano, uh, he was on vacation in India, and he got stuck there. And I believe he's still there for months and months and months and just had to make it work, had to find stable internet, had to find a place to live uh, because of these events. That's a tremendous amount of ingenuity and creativity. And uh, it really is an extraordinary thing to see when people are challenged, how they can rise to the occasion. And despite the fact that the work is hard and despite the fact that a lot of the things we're doing have never been done before by any project, we found a way to make it happen. Another thing is we wanted to have a smooth hard fork. That's what's coming July 29th. So we had to invent new concepts like the hard fork combinator. Never been done before. Okay, let's go do it. That is who we are as a company. And it's the standard that we've set for ourselves and the standard that we've set for our community. So that's where we've been. So where are we going? Well, in, on June 30th, we launched the Shelly node. And uh, every week, we're just going to update that till the 29th. Uh, and then the hard fork happens. And then the month of August, people are staking. And if that was the end of the story, we'd certainly be better than Bitcoin. And we'd be one of the best cryptocurrencies ever built, easiest to list cryptocurrencies, most reliable and secure cryptocurrencies. And we'd already have a lot of accolades, dozens of times more performance, significantly fast settlement time, uh, only 10 kilowatts of power to run a global scale financial system. But that's not good enough. We need things like native assets. We need, so you know, Ethereum has ERC-20, we need that. We need things like multi-sig, we need things like smart contracts, and so the beautiful th thing about how we've structured this project was that there's been a great degree of parallelism. 
So the Gogan team has been working tirelessly with some of the best people in the entire computer science industry and engineering business to create not only a great smart contract experience, but also a great smart contract ecosystem. You see, you can't just walk in and say, we're going to replace everything that's been done before. There are literally hundreds of billions of dollars that have been spent in the Java ecosystem, the .NET ecosystem, C code, C++, and all this other infrastructure, all these applications. And they're not going to change quickly. They'll change methodically and over time and when the incentives are right, but you have to be able to play nice with that legacy infrastructure. Furthermore, you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to accomplish? If your goal is to throw away the internet, throw away servers, throw away all the things that came before us and start anew, you have a lot of freedom, but you're probably not going to get a lot of adoption and you're probably gonna be setting yourself up for failure. If your goal is to say, we're going to extend what came before us with new capabilities, use and utility that have not been seen before or dramatically enhance things that were hard in the past, then suddenly you become an essential part of an existing business model. So when we designed Plutus and Marlowe, the extended UTXO model and our smart contract model, we recognize that the things that go on the chain, the things that go on the blockchain are equally important as the things that go off the chain. Both of these things have to have a symbiotic relationship with each other and work well together. So within the next 120 days, the native asset standard is going to be rolling out for Cardano, and we're going to have a beautiful and great listing experience for issuing assets on Cardano. And uh, we have a lot of presentations at the summit. Minimal Chakravarty in particular is dedicating an entire presentation to why this standard is better. We learned a lot from things like color coins. We learned a lot from things like the ERC-20 standard. And we have a lot of unique advantages with the extended UTXO model and with the way we've designed things to have assets that are significantly easier to issue, cheaper to operate, and eventually have a path to native fees and custom addresses and other things that allow people to build better brand identity and allow people to have a much more uh, rich token experience, not just on the utility token side, but also dealing with permissioned ownership. So things like security tokens, loyalty tokens, all kinds of things. Also, we are launching a beautiful product at the summit, and there's some wonderful presentations about this called Prism. Prism is our identity management system. We realized early on it wasn't good enough just to talk about value, assets. People use assets. Assets are connected to transactions with rich metadata. And if you're going to be operating in regulated environments, if you're going to be conducting commercial activity, if you're going to use a blockchain for a real platform with use and utility for all kinds of applications, whether it be medical records or supply chain, the heart of almost all these systems is the ability to identify people and understand if those counterparties are credible actors to work with. So how do you do that in a decentralized system? And that's really what Prism is exploring. And across blockchain capacity, using industry standards like DIDS, for example, that came out of the W3C, the same body that standardizes CSS and HTML, we worked diligently to build up a beautiful framework that's gonna fit hand in glove on top of Cardano. And it's gonna allow us to open up all kinds of new possibilities with not only how Cardano works, but how people work with Cardano. So for example, currently if you have an exchange and let's say you wanna withdraw some funds, Prism will eventually enable the concept of authenticated addresses. So what you can do is register your credentials and then only withdraw funds to an address that has been signed by those credentials. This adds a second layer of security to your exchange experience. And then from the exchange's perspective, allows them to satisfy new regulations like the FATF's travel rule. And that's just one of hundreds of use cases that one can dream up with varying levels of privacy. And eventually we can enhance the system with uh, state-of-the-art cryptography, like zero knowledge systems. Uh, we, for example, recently created our own snark called Sonics. And we've been a big innovator as a company in that field. And what we can do is blend our identity stack with 
all kinds of new tech that increases your privacy, but also allows you to accomplish many business goals. Like, are you over a certain age or are you a member of a certain group without revealing any more personally identifiable information? And because it is the DID standard, we're big believers in self-sovereign identity. And we're big believers that you should be in charge of your own data. You should be in charge of your own identity, not a government, not a corporation. You should be able to take that with you to the places that you do business and have a lot of control over that. So PRISM is super exciting and it's going to work hand in glove with our native asset standard. It's going to work hand in glove with our smart contracts. Within the next 150 days, Plutus Foundations is going to come out and that's our first entry point to smart contracts for Cardano. There's a lot of work to do between now and then, but what's really exciting about it is that that will bring a whole bunch of functionality and power to Cardano so that not only can we match other systems like Ethereum, but transcend them. Because we designed Plutus in such a way that over time, it's going to become increasingly more interoperable, not with just functional standards, but also imperative standards, and be very easy for third parties to wire their infrastructure, whether it be a Node application, whether it be a Cordova app, whether it be a Java app with our system, and to use the blockchain as a service. What's particularly exciting about Cardano's model is how complementary and layered things are. In particular, because we have stake pools, stake pools are also service providers. So in addition to having the blockchain as a service and having it as a smart contract system, we're going to be able to add all kinds of layer two services through the stake pool model to augment smart contracts. So this will allow us to add all kinds of cool experiences like random number generation, Oracle services, cross blockchain interoperability, Hydra channels, and so forth that will be made available basically as APIs, as easy things to call and interact with to all smart contracts in our system. So you can have the best of both worlds. Uh, you can have the decentralization, censorship resilience, and uh, resistance from tampering that blockchains tend to give you, but also the low cost and efficiency and performance that you tend to get from uh, a more centralized store. And by mixing them together, you get the best of both worlds. So that's coming as well. And those small businesses will profit from that because in addition to getting revenue streams for maintaining Cardano, they're also going to be able to add more and more businesses to their system. Now, I often get asked, how are we going to get developers in our ecosystem? Part of that is the story about how the system as a whole is becoming cross-blockchain. It's becoming multi-ledger. Many DAP developers are realizing there isn't good wisdom and betting the farm on the success of one platform over the other, and they're migrating and moving from chain to chain and making sure that they can work with many systems. So part of our team focuses on making sure that we're included in that conversation. Second, we have the unique advantage that we have all these functional programmers who haven't really been able to do things in a nice way uh, on Ethereum, EOS, or other platforms because they want to write code in Haskell. They want to write code with a functional paradigm. This is where we're going to excel. The things that we've built for Plutus and Marlow are particularly appealing and useful to them, and it allows them to leverage decades of experience and knowledge from some of the best developers in the world to come and build great DeFi experiences and come and build great dApps. Now, the problem is, though, that you have to have the right incentives for people to do that. So we talked a lot and we looked at history and I uh, remember something that George Lucas said, history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. And in 2007, Steve Jobs had the exact same problem that we have. You have a dominant platform, in his case, it was Windows, and he was creating a new platform, the iPhone, and he wanted to incentivize developers to do something in that platform. So there was a strong argument to do so because there were things that you could do with the iPhone that you could not do with the normal desktop experience. And so the use and utility and experiences were quite revolutionary, but they still needed to give people some funds to take the risk to build on that system. So announcing today, we're partnering with Wave Financial and IO Global is setting up a $10 million fund on our side and they're gonna match it over time. Uh, so 20 million in total AUM, specifically to uh, be there for developers who want to build DeFi and dApps. 
Uh, so uh, Steve Jobs worked with John Doerr for his fund for the iPhone. They called it the iFund. And so as an homage to them, we're going to call this the C Fund. And if you guys want to participate, we're already accepting proposals. We set up an email address. If you go to invest at iohk.io and send us an email, send your proposal, uh, we'll, uh, we'll get back to you in a few days, probably a week or two. We're a little busy with the summit. And we'll be setting up a dedicated website throughout the month of July on the iohk.io domain about the C Fund. But basically, its purpose is to take people at the $250,000 to $500,000 range and help us fund and build out a, a great ecosystem of DeFi applications and a great ecosystem of uh, developers. We already have some great partners, and you'll see some of them uh, today and tomorrow at the summit. Uh, people like Beef Chain, for example, and we have some in the security token side and so forth that we've been working with. And as we get closer to the unveiling of Gogan, and we start pushing things to the test net, uh, those will be, of course, announced. But we felt it was really important that we open it up to the community as a whole, not just ours, but the entire blockchain space and those outside of the space who have good ideas that can be funded at the quarter million to half million dollar level, uh, specifically to help get them where they need to go and give them the support and tools that they need. So not only will we invest in them, but we'll, of course, also provide strategic support uh, developer assistance if necessary, and a litany of other services to upgrade and augment, refine their businesses and get them where they need to go. So the C Fund is going to be a lot of fun to run. We have some industry veterans uh, who've been doing this for a while. Les Borsai and David Seamer are the partners from Wave Financial that are coming in to assist us. Uh, they have decades of investment banking experience, and uh, Les is a really good friend of mine. Uh, he started in the music business. He worked with Trent Reznor and a lot of other people. So he brings a different dimension of creativity that uh, I tend to enjoy. Uh, and of course, if I ever need to hire a musician, he's the guy I talk to. So it's a, quite an eclectic group, uh, which has a beautiful marriage of creativity and business together. And that's what makes them unique. You see, overall, we're a pretty unique ecosystem. We've gone from nothing to hundreds of thousands of people. And some of the most humbling moments for me are when people send me pictures of our logo, whether it be the IOHK logo or the ADA symbol or the Cardano logo tattooed on their body. And I say, wow, that's, um, that, that's a statement. And uh, it's a commitment as well. And it reminds me I need to wake up and do a good job every day. I have had people message me and say, hey, here's my daughter's birth certificate. What's it say? And I read the certificate. It says ADA. I say, okay, we really do need to make sure this works uh, because a lot of people believe in us and they're good people. Recently, we had a pretty interesting debate. It was the ITN debate. And we wanted to demonstrate that governance is hard, really hard. And we took a vote and didn't even get enough participation. Why? Because the tools and experience weren't really where they needed to be. So we thought a lot about that and we said, where do we want to go with this? You know, how are we going to open this up so that we can honor that last plank of a third generation cryptocurrency to be a truly sustainable system? How do we do that? You know, we, we want to have a system that allows people to decide for themselves. Where do we, where are we going to go? What are we going to pay for? Governance is truly a difficult topic. My own country, the United States, isn't doing so well right now. Everywhere I look, there's a lot of anger protests, there's a lot of problems, and people feel like they're not listened to and they don't have a voice. Governance is really hard. And when we look to the other parts of our project, we look to venture capital, that's kind of a science. We look to formal methods, there's 40 years of history to draw from. We look to writing good protocols and doing good science, there's 400 years of the scientific method and peer review and academic standards to draw from. There's a great degree of confidence and certainty that we as an organization can have as we step out of that shadow. But when we look to governance, really there's not the case of one government that is so supremely evolved that ubiquitously everybody says that is the perfect model for consent. That is the perfect model for representation. And so uh, as we look to the future and we say, Shelly's out, Gogan is rapidly deploying, how are we going to get to Voltaire? 
So I launched a project on the back of the ITN using the ITN developers, and they have been working diligently for months and months and months, taking that original ITN code base with a project called Project Catalyst, and they've been slowly transforming it into a voting framework specifically for Cardano. And not only did they do that, they built a cell phone app, which will be demoed soon here at the summit. And uh, in a very short period of time, uh, here in July, uh, we partnered with a great firm called Submittable. People will begin uh, having the ability to submit ballots, proposals, requests for funding. So uh, I guess my one more thing is that we launched the C fund, but I really would like to get to the DC fund, the decentralized Cardano fund. And starting from July, when you submit your ballot, you'll be able to start talking to the community. The community will begin to be able to establish priorities and we're building voting systems for this. And starting in August, those systems will launch and all those ITN rewards that roll over. In addition to that 100 million ADA, which is approximately worth about $10 million uh, will roll over as well and be available to the community in tranches. So you'll be able to submit ballots come July and through community participation and voting uh, with our cell phone app and as well as uh, desktop experience that's coming in later funds, uh, the community will be able to prioritize and then approve ballots. So we don't have just one, but actually we now have two funds available. One controlled by our global, we're putting our own money in, $10 million on our side, matched by another 10, managed by some great industry veterans, and the other curated and controlled by you, the community as a whole. It's been a very difficult road to get us to that point. And that was really uh, one of the reasons why we thought it would be an interesting thing to continue the ITN because we could repurpose the existing decentralized network specifically to run these governance components. But that's okay because we actually originally planned to do it in a federated capacity, similar to how we launched Cardano with Byron and then eventually wire it on to Cardano as a captive sidechain, honoring that SLCL model. So that's gonna be the plan. Starting from July, we're submittable, you'll be able to submit ballots, and then entering into August, uh, the voting app will turn on, voting registration will turn on, and uh, Dor uh, is the product manager for all of this. He has a great presentation to explain the details on how registration is going to work. It's simple, easy, and very secure. Uh, it won't quite be like your vote. It'll be a much better experience in that respect. And you'll be able to look at ballots uh, on your cell phone and tap to vote. Uh, so it's pretty simple, pretty easy. And it's going to allow every single person in our ecosystem that has trust and faith in us and has been around for so long and fought for us uh, to be able to actually have a voice and start participating. And for a lot of people who have been desperate for some funding, to do things to help build up our ecosystem, to finally be able to get uh, the funds that they need to be able to execute and do cool things. And there's quite a bit of money set aside specifically for them, for the community. Now there's a lot more to do. Uh, I, for example, would like to have a two-stage ballot process where first we use preference voting to do priorities so that we can winnow down the set of ballots submitted to match the funds available. Second, uh, I'm really interested in innovation management, where when a person submits a ballot, it doesn't just go immediately to the community for consideration, but rather we work with partners and we have had some discussions and we'll uh, present those results in a bit uh, to help people transform their ballots so that they're better formed and they have a higher probability of success and a good outcome for everybody. So not just getting the funding, but also being able to operate efficiently with that. And this brings up a point that there's actually going to be a new small business, uh, a new type of actor in our system, the expert class. You see, we often get asked, well, how do I have a voice if I don't have a lot of ADA? How do I have a voice if I have a lot of skills and knowledge, but I'm not necessarily a big actor? Well, if you look analogously to Bitcoin, there are people like Andreas Antonopoulos, uh, who don't actually hold a lot of Bitcoin, but are domain experts in that field. And so our hope is that we can build our own Andreases in the Cardano ecosystem, people who 
have a lot of knowledge, skill sets, wisdom, capabilities, and they can be involved in that innovation management and they can help curate things. And the beautiful thing is with a voting system, not only can you vote to fund a project, you can vote to fund people to work directly for the Cardano ecosystem. So for example, there's the podcast, The Cardano Effect. Uh, we're hoping to work with them so that they can transition from getting funding from the Cardano Foundation to run their podcast to actually get it straight from the Cardano blockchain. So they can be as objective as possible and represent the Cardano ecosystem as well as possible. Similarly, there's dozens of other actors from the ambassadors in the space uh, to people who could work as experts to help filter out ballots and help people uh, get to where they need to go so that they can have good projects to evolve and grow who can actually have a day job doing nothing but working for Cardano. As early as August, that conversation starts and each and every one of you is gonna have the capability to propose and, and if you wanna be full-time part of this ecosystem and make this your livelihood, you can do that. That's a pretty amazing thing. Um, it reminds me of when eBay came out and people could actually make money being power sellers. The platform created hundreds of thousands of new jobs, different jobs and jobs we'd ever seen before. All great platforms do this and Cardano needs to be no different. So in addition to Gogan being imminent and native assets rolling out and the Plutus Foundation rolling out, Voltaire is also imminent. We're launching that at the same time as Shelley. And just like how we launched Shelley with the ITN, we're launching the VIT, the Voltaire Incentivized Testnet, and basically giving people the opportunity to participate in voting, giving people opportunity to get funding that they need, and allow us to evolve and grow the voting mechanics very rapidly in a safe sandbox and uh, get um, funding where it needs to go. In addition to this, there's some great presentations that the foundation is bringing on at the summit, uh, which will cover the Cardano improvement proposal process. So it's not good enough just to fund things. We also have to have a meaningful discussion about where Cardano is going to go as a blockchain. So that's generally done in the blockchain industry with what's called an improvement proposal. Bitcoin has the BIPs, the Bitcoin improvement proposals. Ethereum has the IPs, the Ethereum improvement proposals. And similarly, we have the SIPs, the Cardano improvement proposals. So uh, it's not good enough just to have a structured process where people can write them. You need to have a voting system where eventually the community can reach consent over which ones to adopt and where to go, especially as protocols become more complex and we have to accept trade-offs to meet the needs of the future. And as a consequence, uh, we have been working hand in glove with the Cardano Foundation, as has Emergo, and they've gotten to a point where they've created the first Cardano improvement proposal, a Cardano improvement proposal specifically for uh, the entire improvement proposal system. And Frederick is going to deliver a great presentation on the lessons learned and where that's at. And over time, dozens of improvement proposals from the community and from IO Global and from other actors like Emergo and some of the other core developers will come and start uh, formalizing these ideas. And then just the same way that you're going to vote on treasury ballots, the community eventually will converge and vote on improvement proposals which means that we can have much more meaningful civil debates and have much better processes to have debates and conversations about how are we going to evolve the system as a whole. This will allow us to achieve decentralization. And you'll notice that there's a thread that runs through our entire effort. And in particular, that thread is that everything we do is interconnected. You know, this decentralized brain idea that I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation that also allows all those protocols and ideas to be codified as a CIP. And the fact that we now have Voltaire imminently on the way, starting July, August, you'll see all these amazing things come out. That very process will allow us to not only discuss these things, but potentially fund them. See, science comes in raw, not completely well-decided, well-built forms. Uh, and sometimes you need some additional funding and discussion to get protocols where they need to go. Well, Voltaire will enable that. And over time, our treasury system become, can become one of the largest funders of academic, theoretical, and applied research in the world. We, in essence, will become our own NSF. That's a beautiful thing.
and it tells the world that Cardano is not just here for itself, it's here to create patent-free open source research for everyone that is interdisciplinary. It's not just about computer science, it's about political science. It's not just about political science, it's about economics. Ultimately, it's about the users that we intend. You know, we care a lot about economic identity. We care a lot about the developing world. We care a lot about the billions of people who have been left behind by globalization and never had a chance to rise. The ultimate point of the work that we do and why we have invested so much time, money, and effort, $100 million, five years, 60 plus papers, a million plus lines of code, this is not a trivial endeavor. It's been the work of my lifetime, has been the fact that if we get it right, we can build an operating system that the world can use to do things differently, to vote differently, to have different concepts of property rights, to have different types of jobs, to be able to work in a global marketplace. And most importantly, the least amongst us will have access to the same system that the richest and most powerful amongst us do. There's never been a case in human history where we could achieve that. And really, the most magical part of all of it is that power is pushed to the edges. You know, I'm an internal optimist, and no matter how bad things get, I've never succumbed to cynicism, and I've never believed that somehow the people around me aren't worth or worthy of self-governance and autonomy. I believe that when you give people power and when you give people opportunity and you give people the ability to decide for themselves, they won't squander it. Rather, ultimately, over the long run, accepting some mistakes along the way, that they will rise to the occasion that they will surprise you. There's no greater example than the cryptocurrency industry. 10 years ago, we were nothing, just a laptop mining. 10 years later, I go to Mongolia and camel herders have it. I go to the country of Georgia and I tour massive warehouses of miners. People's day job every day is to wake up and do a small thing in this giant industry that didn't even exist a decade ago whose raison d'etre is strictly to give power to the people and to make the world a bit more fair. I think what we've done here in Cardano isn't that we've constructed a cryptocurrency or built a great community. We've laid out a blueprint for how to think a little differently and to play a different game for the world as a whole and bring all these new ideas with the money, the resources, the inspiration, and the community necessary to realize to the people who need them. Some of my most treasured moments have been uh, when I went to Ethiopia, to Rwanda, to South Africa, and I had a chance to meet people who have less than nothing. People who really lost every capacity to rise. And despite that, they were some of the happiest, most inspiring people I've ever met, and most worthy of our compassion and most worthy of our help if we can. But we will never be able to achieve anything by just simply giving people things. We have to give them the tools so that they can build things for themselves and compete fairly. That's where this poverty comes from and why these countries can't rise. The systems are bad, not the people. And the point of cryptocurrencies has always been, in the long term, to liberate all of us and give us a different way of doing things. No one's happy with the way we are doing things. It's why we have the protests. No one's happy with the way the world works. It's why we still have these wars and the strife and these problems. And I'd like to believe that if our life's work is successful, we can look back and say those were the bad times. And thank God we live in the good times. So it's been a long road and the road ahead is even longer, steeper and harder. But what gives me great solace is I'm no longer alone on that road. We have an army each and every one of you. And I've done my best to get you to a point where you can start helping in your own way and be able to make your own decisions where, where this platform goes. And I never want to leave. I want to be here as long as I can, as long as my body will let me. But I don't want to be the leader. I want to be just alongside of you and uh, building alongside of you. So with the C Fund, you can come to us and work with us directly. With the DC Fund, 
with the launch of Voltaire, you can work with each other. And either way, we're going to get it done. And our best years are ahead of us. Our best times are ahead of us. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And it's going to be worthwhile. Still a few more bumps along the way, but we'll get there. Thank you all for coming to my event. Thank you all for coming uh, to Cardano and giving us the time of day. And I cannot wait to listen to the 100 plus other speakers, the panels, and hear a lot of really cool, interesting ideas. And I cannot wait to see what you, the community, come up with with Voltaire. It's hard to believe that we've finally gotten here and that we're shipping the end in the and Shelly at the same time. And it's really hard to believe that uh, we're getting to a point where we get to work with so many incredible people. It's the privilege of a lifetime. Thank you for listening and good luck everyone. <laughs>